good to go? Right, well, welcome everyone. Um, I hope everyone actually is familiar with the title, where it came from. It's from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Uh, it's actually from the words of um, Arthur Dent. In, um, well, I I'm not an expert on that <laughs> program, but that's where it comes from anyway, so just in case you were wondering. One person was wondering anyway. <laughs> so um, let's get started. I, I think uh, you all know what a queue is, basically. I mean, uh, you've all been in queues at one time or another, I'm sure. So um, the dictionary tells us that uh, it's to form a line while waiting for something. Um, but there's a sort of negative emotion tends to be associated with queues. You know, we think of queues as being a bad thing, really, don't we? Um, we hate queues. We hate being in queues, uh, especially when it's raining, of course. Um, we think of queues as being things that make us wait, and we don't like waiting. I mean, why should we wait? Right? Well, the aim of my presentation today is uh, to try to convince you that actually some queues are a good thing, and uh, it's actually a good idea to have queues of some sort. Um, so some queues are a good thing. Uh, and even in everyday life, we know that some queues are, are actually there for a very good reason. You know, sometimes uh, they're there to keep us safe. We, you know, waiting is actually of benefit to us. Uh, and sometimes uh, processes need to be synchronized um, for various reasons. Uh, and so uh, we may not like to wait, but sometimes we just have to wait. So there are good queues and there are bad queues. But what I'd like to say is that uh, what we should aim to do is to queue messages instead of people. Uh, so people don't like waiting. We shouldn't have people waiting. What we should have is, is messages waiting. But why queue at all? Um, I'm going to give you a couple of e examples which are fairly common, I think. Uh, image processing. Uh, I'm sure we've all had occasions when uh, we've had to process images, uh, like the user uploads an image and we need to crop it or resize it or add a watermark or something like that. That's a task that takes time, it takes memory, uh, and if 100 people all decide to do it at the same time, then our server tends to run rather slow. And it would be nice to be able to uh, do something about that, and queues are one uh, way in which we can assist with that. Uh, another example which is uh, actually predates the internet, really, um, sending documents. Um, particularly in e-commerce systems, you get the situation where you know somebody clicks the buy button, and then a whole series of things have to happen after that, including things like generating a PDF with an invoice in it, um, sending that invoice, wrapping it in an email, sending it off to the client, um, sending a purchase order off to uh, the supplier, uh, sending a, an email off to the administrators to sell them as a, an, uh, an order has just arrived, sending picking notes off to a warehouse. All those sort of things have to occur but very often we're expecting on our websites for all that to occur in the same request that was generated when the user clicks the buy button. And that's quite a lot to expect of, uh, of, of any system. And we certainly don't want the user to wait for all that stuff to happen. Uh, ideally, we would like it to happen in the background. So queuing messages instead of people. So I don't know how many people are already familiar with message queues, but my contention here is that we should be uh, using message queues, asynchronous message queues, uh, to help us do these things. But what is a message queue? Well, if you can imagine that you've got a, a client process, um, you know, it's a, a, a job running on a web site, uh, which has some heavy work to do, uh, image processing or sending documents or whatever. Um, so instead of that, that, actual, that client actually doing that work right there and then, uh, what we do instead is we describe that process, describe what needs to be done, and drop that message on a queue. And I'll describe what the queue is in a minute. Um, and once you've done that, that's a very quick process, the client can get on with its work. It can, it can do, usually these clients tend to be user-facing, so the user can get on with whatever they're doing. They don't have to wait. There's a description of what needs to be done is put on that queue somewhere else. At some later time, which might be microseconds, or it could be minutes or hours or days later, uh, some server will connect to that queue, pull the messages off it, and actually execute those tasks then. They can actually you know, process the images or send the documents or whatever. And we're not so worried about how long that takes because it's not slowing the user down at all. So in image processing, for example, we have a task that takes a lot of time, well, too much time usually, but 
It does take time. It requires a lot of memory very often. If you, you know, you can be processing uh, quite large images. Uh, it can take far more memory than, than is normal to, a, to allocate to uh, a web task. Uh, you know, it can take hundreds of megabytes sometimes to, uh, to resize an image, do some, do some work on it. Um, and we have a problem with if, if hundreds or thousands of users are throwing images at the server all at the same time, it can actually threaten the stability of that server. But with a queue, it still takes time, but it's not the user's time. It can happen at a later time, if need be. It still requires a lot of memory, but it's not the user's memory. The background task can have a few hundred megabytes allocated to it, and it can process images quite happily. The user's task can just have the standard default PHP allocation of memory, which is, what, 16 megabytes, 32 megabytes, whatever you happen to set up at the time. Because it's not the user's task that's processing the images. Um, and queues naturally throttle the whole process because, you know, if 100 people or 1,000 people upload images at the same time, all you're doing is queuing up 1,000 messages, and that's a very lightweight, very fast task. The server that's pulling those images, pulling those requests off that queue is only ever really processing one at a time. So even a 1,000 images, you're only processing those images one at a time, so your servers actually can be very, very stable. And the same argument applies for sending documents. Um, Sending those documents takes time, requires memory. What happens when you get thousands of them all, all occurring at the same time? Queues can actually help spread that load and it can spread that, uh, that risk. So it's all about decoupling, de decoupling the client and the server, uh, decoupling in space, time, and synchronization. So de space decoupling is uh, a matter of these processes, the client and the server processes, don't need to happen on the same physical machine. They can happen on different machines in different locations. So those images don't need to be processed on the same physical web server that's actually processing your, your front-end clients. It can be on, a, on some background server, different data center, different somewhere else anyway. It's also decoupling in time because uh, those heavy tasks are getting deferred. They're not necessarily being processed immediately. They could be processed at some later time. And that uh, also enables us to, as I mentioned before, throttle those, those task streams. So we, don't ha we can regulate the rate at which those, those tasks are actually carried out. And that helps us cope with unreliable systems and unreliable networks. It doesn't particularly matter if a server dies as long as the queue is still there because the, queue, this, the, the tasks will be still be sitting in that queue waiting for that server to come back. And as soon as that server comes back, it carries on processing the queues. And it decouples in synchronization. Uh, clients should never block. So basically, your user should never be stopped from carrying on doing their work um, by the fact that you've got a queue there. Right? So you put a message onto a queue, and immediately you can carry on working. You're not waiting for the queue. You're not waiting for anything to happen in the background. And the, all these things together ha help us uh, build systems that have redundancy built in and are more scalable. Uh, Queues, uh, there are various patterns associated with, with queues. Uh, I'm certainly not going to try to describe all of them. Uh, these are uh, just a few of the, uh, the most important ones, or the most often used ones. So first of all, we have uh, a request reply queue. So basically what happens here is you've got a producer, some, a client that's producing messages. And they put those messages on a queue, and we can see them. We've got five sitting in a queue here. And then at some point, your consumer, which will be your server typically, um, connects up to that queue and pulls a message off, and it processes that message. In other words, it executes whatever instructions are required to actually handle that message, which might be processing an image or sending a document or any other things. And having finished processing that task, it'll then typically connect to uh, another queue to send the reply back. It won't connect to the same queue. It sends to a different queue. It's a reply queue. Um, and I've labeled that R1 to so indicate it's not the same message that's coming back. It's a, it's a different message. Uh, and then, of course, it's free to pick the next one off the queue. Meanwhile, uh, that reply can go back to um, wherever it needs to go, wherever it needs to be processed. Typically, it won't be the, the original producer of that message because that very often is a, uh, a client-facing, you know, user-facing process, and we don't want to make them wait for that reply to come back. So typically, it will be some other process that will handle that reply. 
And in fact, very often the, the replies will actually just be thrown away because in a lot of cases like image processing, for example, you actually don't, you're not interested in the reply so much. Uh, it doesn't really matter. You don't need to know when the, when the image finished processing, usually. Um, so you, there, there is no reply message. And if one is generated, well, you just send it to dev null or something and just throw it away. And that immediately enables us to um, handle multiple producers pushing messages into the same queue. It doesn't have to be one producer pushing one queue per, per producer. Um, and it also enables us to have multiple consumers taking messages off that queue. So here we've got four consumers here and each takes a message off the queue in turn. Uh, there are various algorithms for deciding which uh, consumer gets, the, gets which message off, off the queue. The most common one tends to be just a round robin thing where the next one available is, is, is pulls it off the queue. But there are others. Um, and then one, as soon as one of them becomes free because it's finished its task, it just pulls the next one off the queue. And so it goes on. So that obviously enables us to uh, scale systems better because uh, you know if we need if we if we get a lot of images being processed all at the same time, well we can just plug in a few more consumers to pull more messages off the uh, off the queue. And a variation on that is is a pipeline. So basically, you just connect a lot of request reply queues together. Um, uh, the first one will take a message off the queue, process it. And then instead of replying, it basically just pushes another message onto, onto the next queue in the sequence, onto the next consumer in the sequence. Uh, and then you can, you can just plug um, these separate consumers, these separate processes together in a, in a pipeline and process them that way. And finally, there's uh, one called publish subscribe or pub sub, um, where the only difference really is that uh, each message that's taken off the queue is actually cloned across all the consumers. So they all get the same message. And typically what you, you think of this in terms of is those consumers are subscribing to uh, a topic um, and the producers are publishing messages out onto those queues. Typically in this scenario, you wouldn't actually have any replies going back. Um, but there may be the consumers may forward messages onto other places. Pipeline pattern. Well, for example, if you're uh, doing uh, image processing at huge scale, uh, I don't know whether uh, there's a Netflix or YouTube or something where they're doing videos, really. It might be that there's several stages of image processing or several stages of processing uh, occurring. So, for example, to take a simple example, if you've got an image and, uh, and you need to, first of all, um, crop it and then resize it and then add a watermark then you could actually split those across three different servers. So the first one crops it, second one watermarks it, or resizes it, and the last one crops it. Well, that's kind of a silly, trivial example. You probably wouldn't actually do that, but it's that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. E-commerce systems, for example, if, you're, if you've got these multiple uh, events occurring, generating PDFs and then emailing them, well, one, one process might be to generate the PDF. It then sends a message saying, well, okay, this PDF is now ready. You need to wrap it in an email and send it. Yeah, that sort of thing. Yes, Rodney. Excellent. Okay, so there's uh, quite a number of packages available which actually give you this queue capability. Um, and these are just a, a few of the, the major ones out there. These, not all of these are packages. AMQP is a, is a protocol. Uh, there's a whole series of packages that, are, uh, that use that particular protocol. You've got Zero MQ. IBM ha has a proprietary um, pr protocol that they use, although I think they've got um, they may not be open source, but they're free clients that you can use on various platforms. Uh, Amazon have their simple queue system, or simple queue service, I forget what they call it now. Uh, Amazon SQS. Uh, Microsoft have theirs. 
MQTT is actually a protocol. It's uh, mainly for telemetry, but it's becoming increasingly used now in the Internet of Things. So there's a whole raft of these things around. And they each tend to have different characteristics. So if you're building a queuing system or using queuing in your applications, you need to kind of select the ones with the, with the characteristics that you actually need for a particular job. I'm not going to go into too much detail on this, but uh, we've got things like locality. So some, some queues, for example, will only run on, on one physical machine. You can't exchange messages between machines. Um, persistent, non-persistent, basically what happens if, you, if the server dies or it's switched off or something like that. Do you, when you switch it back on again, are those messages still there in the queue or are they volatile and they just disappear? Um, do messages have an in-flight period or not? I'll actually describe what that means uh, a few slides further on. Um, some queues don't preserve message order, so sometimes uh, queues will preserve, be strictly first in, first out, but very often uh, queues don't have that ca characteristic and they will pull messages out in different orders. Amazon, for example, uh, doesn't guarantee message order. Some queues will automatically eliminate duplicate messages, others don't. Um, they vary on the, what happens when the queue is full. So if you've got a server, if you've got a client connects to a queue and the queue is already full, it's used up all its, all its available memory, what happens? Um, it could be that the user gets blocked at that point. That's obviously not a very desirable characteristic if we can avoid that. If it's a user-facing process, we would try to avoid that. Um, so sometimes if it's a memory queue, uh, what will happen is that the, the messages will then start overflowing onto disk. Um, but obviously that has performance implications, so you may not necessarily want that characteristic either. Other queues will just throw the message away. So you need to understand what is going to happen under those circumstances and choose the right uh, kind of queuing behavior. Yes? Uh, are there any priority limits? Like some messages might uh, have priority over some messages? Yeah, some, some queues, queuing packages do have that characteristic. Um, I didn't actually mention it here because you can kind of do it without even having it that queuing available. You can do things like triaging queues, or triaging messages. Um, so. If, if you know that a, there's a high priority message, this must get through, you send it to a high priority queue. If it's a low priority message, you send it to a low priority queue. So a, it's actually almost trivial to arrange a priority system if you, if you need to do that. But some queue packages have it in, inherently built in and say uh, you have set a flag or something to say this is a, a, an emergency message or something and it goes, and it's prioritized over other messages within the same queue. Yes, yes, you can. Yeah. Specific that people five minutes, five minutes. That's right, yes, you can. Yeah. I've never actually quite you needed to actually use that kind of thing, but yeah, I've seen it I've seen it available. Yeah. Because it's it's something I then I do every way, five minutes and check if this thing is, is right. there. And if it's not there, you don't get for example to it there is an alert. Yeah. And uh, so that could be a good way to check this kind of thing. Excellent, yeah. Right, so yes. Yes, yes, excellent. Right, so let's, uh, let's talk about using queues in Joomla. The big problem with all of these packages, well, almost, not all of them, but all, most of the, these packages is that they actually require special server software to be installed on the server. Uh, I've been talking about special binaries being installed on it. So typically, most shared hosting systems, forget it, you're not going to be able to install those packages. So what I've been interested in for some time is, is, is there a way, in fact, in which we can get it, get queuing uh, implemented in Joomla as a native PHP um, system so that we don't have to rely on any external packages uh, on, uh, so that we can actually run it on the, on the, I wouldn't say low cost, but your typical hosting environment, you can actually be able to run it on that. Uh, and then... With that, in, in that sort of scenario where we've, we've got a native PHP implementation, we could then offer uh, optional adapters. So if you have 0MQ installed or you have an AMQ, AMQP client or whatever, you can have an adapter which will enable you through your PHP interface to push messages into those proprietary queues, queues or, or not, well not proprietary, but non-standard queues as it were, non-implementable queues that most people can't install but you, you can on certain servers. Um, so I actually wrote a little package that actually does this. 
Um, you, it's on GitHub, except that actually it isn't. <laughs> I'm afraid I ran out of time before I, before I came here, so I didn't get time to actually, uh, the, the repository is there, but it's empty. Uh, but certainly within, within the next week or so, I will, I will actually get the code up there, so it's, uh, it's available to everyone. Sorry? You could. It's in a queue, yes, exactly, yes, it's in, it's in a queue. Um, basically, it, it just it provides a very basic uh, standard interface to a choice of different queues with different characteristics. It's very simple code. Um, it currently supports those uh, queue types array, which is basically you just putting stuff into a PHP array. It's pretty useless, actually, but it's useful for testing. Um, you can actually put the messages on the file system, so each message is basically a file that sits in a directory somewhere. Um, it will also queue into a database table, so you just set up a table, and each message is a row in that table. Uh, it can also support uh, Unix System 5 IPC messages. Um, that's an example of a message that you can't send outside the system, so it's in, and it's a process communications thing within a, a single physical server. I'm not entirely sure whether you would typically be able to use that on a uh, on your shared hosting environment. I don't know whether hosts tend to block it or not. It works on my Ubuntu desktop, but <laughs> whether it works out on the, in the real world, I'm not quite sure. Um, and there's an adapter for Amazon SQS, which is what I use actually quite a lot nowadays. Um, that is basically has a web interface. So you can, uh, it's just an HTTP request out, out to their servers to send a message or receive a message. And there's an, ad an adapter for that. It uses the Amazon PHP SDK, so you have to write, r download that uh, first and install that. But it's not a binary, so it's, it's all done purely in PHP. Um, it's all documented and unit tested, surprisingly enough. Um, and of course, pull requests are welcome, so if you want to try and improve it. I hope you want to try and improve it, then please do so. So just to give you a flavor of what it looks like, um, to send a message, uh, what you would typically do is you start off with a couple of lines of code here just to, just to set up the queue. Normally I'd do this, this in one line, but it's one line that won't fit on my screen, so I split it into two. Um, and then to send the message, you uh, s uh, call the, the, the send method. Um, the first argument there is, is the name of the queue, so it's whatever you like, it's just a string. And the second is, uh, is the message that you want to send. Um, it's a string here, it doesn't have to be a string, it can be an array, an object, whatever. It gets serialized by the queuing system itself. Um, by default it will use the PHP serialize. Um, command, but uh, you can actually override that and use whatever serializer you want. And then to receive a message, um, the first two lines are exactly the same. You just set up, the, set up the queue, and then you receive a message from, or you pull a message from that queue, so you just give it the name of the queue you want, and it will return the message. Although it's not actually the message that's being returned, it's actually a message uh, object which includes your original message as the payload within that. So there's some metadata effectively associated it with it that you're getting back as well. Uh, so typically in your, in your server, you would uh, process the message at that point. Um, but if your server dies at that point, uh, it will not actually have removed the message from the queue. Uh, this is this in-flight period that, uh, that it allows. So there's a certain time period which, uh, which is allowed between uh, pulling the message off the queue and actually physically deleting it. To physically delete it off the queue, you have to call a delete method. Uh, and the, the reason here, the reason for doing this really is that uh, if you've got a server that dies halfway through, uh, you know, it's pulled the message off, uh, it's processing that message. Normally, it would then, when it's finished processing, it deletes it off the queue, and everything's fine. But if it pulls it off the queue and then probably dies, what happens? You don't lose the message because actually after a certain period of time, it's effectively returned to the queue and is available for some other process to pick it up. It's only off the queue when you delete it. But there's a problem. And the problem is that to run these, uh, the server side of this, to receive these messages, typically you would need some kind of cron task to actually 
decide when to pull the message off the queue. And as we all know, there's low-cost toasts uh, have difficulty uh, with crons because uh, very often they're not, there's no cron available. They don't allow crons. Um, I'm not entirely sure why they don't allow it. Uh, it. It seems a little bit silly to me, but there are a lot of them out there. So typically you would need to uh, implement uh, either a proper cron or some sort of pseudo cron, i.e. You, um, you set up a task which pings the server every now and again to say, yeah, process the queue, process the queue. Um, and there are, I think there are third party websites out there that will even that do that for you. So you can just set up a, you know, log in, get an account on one of their servers and it will just ping your server periodically and uh, uh, effectively drive the queue for you, drive the crons for you. So that is a bit of a problem when we need to really solve that within Joomla generally is to you know, have some sort of strategy in place as to what to tell people how to set these sort of things up. But I did think that it might be possible to um, use a plug-in event to process queues on systems which don't allow cron. So for example, if we got um, uh, smart search indexing is a typical example. This is, in fact, where I started thinking about this thing within Joomla. Um, when you, if, if you have very large articles within Joomla and you click the Save button uh, and you've got Smart Search in operation, it should, at that point, index that article. But if it's a very large article, that indexing process can take a long time. Uh, and in fact, in extreme cases, it will actually time out before the indexing process is finished. So it would be nice to put that onto a queue and have the indexing done in the background. But what happens if you if you don't have a cron that will drive that indexing process. Um, so what I thought was actually if we have a plugin event there so that if you don't have cron available, this plugin kicks in. So if, if you, you save it um, to a queue, but it's a local queue, and immediately you fire an event which says go and process the queue. Um, so it pulls the message straight off the queue and presses it there and then. So you don't get any advantage from queuing, but it does enable you to have that indexing process um, done in the same user request. And if you then have a queue installed, which has a cron and drives it and all the rest of it, all you've got to do is disable the plugin so it doesn't process the queue immediately and allows a background process to process it instead. Could one just be processed with the agent? That way the client would have to read. Poss possibly, but again, uh, you've got the issue that not all our processes are AJAX driven. Not all the things we want to do with queuing are necessarily driven by users. So we want to, I was looking for a generic process. Yes, you can do that, certainly. Yeah, that's one approach. I was trying to find a an approach that would work regardless of how you use the queuing system, whether it's user-driven or it's background process-driven or whatever. And for the existing uh, plugins, the queue plugins, um, it will allow you to, uh, if the thread gets big, go easily do something else and in the background... Uh, the not, not, if, not if you haven't got cron. All right, so the plugin, what it does is... You'd have a line of code which says, add this message to the queue. Next line of code whiz would be, trigger the plugin, and the plugin is going to process the queues there and then. Right? And you won't get a return back from the, uh, from, the plug uh, from the plugin until it's finished processing that task. So it's not asynchronous. It's not do you're not doing two but things at once. You, you're doing doing you could do, as again, if you've got a client process that you can drive that with. Yeah. Okay, so here's some of the um, use cases within Joomla itself that, that, that have occurred to me anyway over, over a period of time. You can probably add a few more to this without too much difficulty. I've mentioned image resizing and, and watermarking and so forth already. And I've mentioned smart search already, indexing. I think smart search is, the, is probably the, the area that is most in need of queuing um, because there are a lot of people out there now trying to use smart search on um, the slightly larger sites uh, and, and it's running into problems. They're running into problems there with, with scaling it up 
uh, and we need queuing to relieve that issue. Uh, hit counters, uh, it occurred to me, somebody's uh, emailed something on the, on the mailing list recently about hit counters, and it occurred to me, well actually, if you, uh, if you queue your messages, if, you, if, if someone hits the website uh, and you just send out a message to a queue, which is not necessarily in the same system, to say so, somebody hit this site, or somebody hit, hit this particular uh, page, um, so it's not in memory, it's, it's not, in, uh, not on desk or anything like that. And then you can actually process those hits in the background at some later time. So you're not affecting the performance of the system. Right? So what you can do is every five minutes process the queue and then just accumulate all those hits and update the database at that point. E-commerce I've already mentioned, sending documents, that kind of stuff. Uh, you can use it there. Throttling. Sending out emails, so if somebody uses the bulk email sending facility in Joomla, I've heard occasions where they've sent out so many emails they get blocked. Uh, again, we can use queues to throttle that process. And anywhere you where you need monitoring or logging, um, you can basically send out messages with that information. So you're not slowing down your, your front-facing servers. Uh, you're just sending very, very lightweight messages out with the information that you need in them. And they can be processed later in the background. And statistics and report generation. You very often, generating reports is an intensive task. You know, you're doing uh, quite large database queries, which are very often very slow queries. Um, but you can actually queue those up, do stuff like that in the background. You used about web services. I did, didn't I? <laughs> there wasn't room on my slide. <laughs> So, have I convinced you that uh, using queues in Joomla is actually a good idea? Yeah, some, yes, some yeses, some nodding heads there, good. <laughs> okay, I thought I'd finish with uh, some tips, a few tips, get it. Um, queues are cheap, all right? They're very lightweight. Um, they don't take much time, so feel free to use lots of them. You can use queues for just about anything. Um, you, know, you, can, you can create queues on the fly, no problem at all. And they don't cost you anything in terms of resources and memory and everything like that. They're very, very lightweight. So you can actually use them quite imaginatively. So generally, you should avoid fat messages. That is, uh, messages with a lot of content in them. So on the image processing, for example, you would never send the image in the message. <laughs> What you would do is you would send a pointer to that image in the message. You would send the file name or a URL or something like that. Uh, you want to keep the messages as small and lightweight as possible because message systems very rarely can handle large messages efficiently. Most of them, in fact, have a limit on the size of the message that you can send, and it may only be a K, a couple of K. I think Amazon has 32K limit or something like that. It's quite low. Guaranteed delivery. You, you often hear this... Um, as a requirement in, in message systems, um, basically there's no such thing as guaranteed delivery. There, no matter what you come up with as a way, way to give you guaranteed delivery, delivery, there's always going to be some scenario which will break it. Um, Murphy's Law will always win in the end, basically. You can come very close to, to guaranteed delivery, you, but it's a matter of probabilities. You know, you can, it's a matter of getting those num the number of nines after the decimal point is to the point where you're happy with it in terms of reliability. Chris? Yes, Ronnie. Um, with one of our clients, uh, Matt, uh, she wanted to know that the two container companies just come, come with it. On the global web side for training, we do all the web-based booking, and then we by, by send it to a Bitcoin server, and then by a proxy, we can secure it into the Bitcoin server where it's matched to the, the resource and URL system within the organization. So it's not just a proxy server, a Bitcoin server, So many issues with all of their systems, but the full value chain we were building is running a lot of issues with the web service. So we built a, a mesh queue system on top of the mesh to the web service integration, so, so the message queue system will control if it, it uh, sends uh, an answer and a reply. So we use the message queue system to verify the, the basis, so that not if the data is correct as the web service does, does but if the data is there, if it's going around and it's coming back, then we just queue all the messages on the web service if, if there's no connection anywhere else to the system. And they instantly they get the system up and running again, so 32 Amazon systems going around. So it, it's really
experience that they're in huge delivery at some point. Yeah, but I can always find you a scenario where that will fail. Yep. It's just a matter of probability. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, Peter. Um, if you have a multiple server, mm -hmm. like uh, one server is handling uh, the image processing, um, and there might be at different locations, or um, can you have the, uh, the data between the servers also have a constant uh, daily compression? Yes, you can do. In fact, some queuing systems actually have that as part of their native um, handling that they, they will actually handle encryption of messages. In fact, Amazon does that, for example. You can send it an unencrypted message, effectively. It, you're actually sending it over HTTPS anyway, but they apparently, so they tell us anyway, imply encryp uh, apply encryption to that message on their servers. So whilst it's passing through their network, it's encrypted through their, through their network as well. Not, all, not everybody does that. And of course, there's nothing to stop you actually encrypting it yourself before you send it. So if you want complete end-to-end uh, -end security, you can, you can do that yourself. Do it at the application level rather than at the queue level. Yeah, I, I, I to totally understand the need for, for the Amazon queue, for instance, but if it's basically just like a database with the rows in it, well, why not just store it in your own database? Uh, well, you could do. Uh, Amazon uh, have the advantage that they're doing it at massive scale, so you can send out millions of messages simultaneously, and it's no load on your server. But really, the load is. is Yes, that's anyway, right. Yeah. It's not really storing a, a million rows in a database. That's that's true. Yeah, yeah. But you can you can do things like, for example, handling on on different servers. Um, I mean, it, all they're doing is giving you a piece of in infrastructure that you would otherwise have to supply yourself. I have a good example. We we ran a, a, a hundred thousand users on email on an email service, and, and when we took over the client, um, they couldn't supply us. And the nice thing about Amazon, actually, is that you don't need to have any server binaries installed on your server. You know, it's, it, it's a, it's com you can do it purely in PHP. I mean, but you could do it purely in, in a table in a database. Yes, you could. Yeah, so absolutely. The, yeah. the detriment is, uh, of course, is that because you need a server on mass scale, it's a bit of time, it's a bit of mess, and then you create thousands of messages, yeah. uh, you delete them after all, and after your main server, you go, go. So with the, with and it will be queued and then queued again in a way where the, uh, with with an idea of what happens in your system. So with the money going your queue, you have dragon pictures of all the you you know how many uh, workers what they are doing. Uh, no, but that's do what I mean. It doesn't sound like the, the the Amazon queue has the workers. It just has the list of mm. tasks. Right? That's right. Yeah. So to write the, the ball, you don't have these issues. And you can also use uh, MySQL synchronization that can be offline, so that you can have a removed uh, container that is distributed on the queue system, and temporarily you write locally, and you let the system synchronize, get the data on the other machine when it's have time, and after that you can pick up the message on the other one and work with uh, Amazon or other systems. No, but Personally, I, I well use for 
seven years MT series from IBM uh, for banking system. And uh, we use this technology in the theory and spread on different machines with very complex workflow. Because the advantage is that effectively, uh, if you work in a lot of system like uh, special uh, space agency that has to process the image coming from space and do mapping like Google Map and so on and analyze, you have a lot of process and edit process that are sometimes spread in different companies because they are specialized in such processing with a billing system, with a charging for this process, but you can do that. Mm -hmm. And this is the advantage of the tool because you can have different plugins from external companies that provide additional value. Yeah. There's lots of ways to solve these problems. You have to pick the solution that's, exactly. that's appropriate for you. Absolutely. And the other thing I would say is that um, the way that uh, the Q software that I've written is, is done is that you, s you determine what kind of queue that you're going to connect to at the configuration point. So if you want to swap from running on a database to running it through Amazon, you just change your configuration variables. No changes in code required to actually do that. Well, you can provide your own metadata. If you want to wrap it in, uh, you know, wrap your core message with some additional metadata, just wrap it yourself, then send it to the queue. Okay. But what's coming back from the queue as metadata is things like the date and time stamp of, of when it w went into the queuing system. Uh, you know, that sort of, sort of housekeeping type stuff. You know, there's, no, there's not a lot of information there. But it just makes sense to have a, a little bit of metadata associated with that message so you can make decisions on, on what to do with it when you receive it. Duplicate messages. Um, generally, you should design applications to assume that some messages may get duplicated. If that is a serious problem for you, and sometimes it is, then sort it out at the application level, basically. So what you need to do, typically, if, if that is a problem, is you store a history of every message that you've received or every task that you've processed. And then before you process the next one, you check in your database to see whether you've already done it. And if you have, you just forget it. But queuing systems, most queuing systems, um, will either not give you that complete guarantee that they will never produce duplicates, or at least you can't necessarily rely on it. There will be occasions when, uh, when it won't get through. It's a matter of balancing these characteristics. Um, usually, if, if, you're, if you're worried about missing messages, you'll tend to design the application to overproduce messages. So if it thinks that a message might not have got through, the strategy would be to just send it again. But if you do that strategy, then you're more likely to get duplicates. Uh, so if, you, if you're worried about missing messages, then overproduce messages, but clear out the duplicates at the other end, that sort of thing. So it's a matter of designing it to, to according to what you actually need. Message ordering. Um, not all queuing systems give you first in, first out. Amazon, for example, doesn't. Amazon doesn't for an interesting reason, actually. It's because their messages are replicated all the messages that are sent through the queuing system are replicated across multiple servers. So in case any of the servers die, you've still got your messages in the queue somewhere. But when you pull the messages back off the queue, successive messages don't necessarily come back from the same server each time. So message one might come back from one server, message two might come back from a different server. Um, but because of that, they're in different locations, you can't necessarily synchronize them, so they may come out of, out of sequence. I've actually found in practice that maybe one out of 10 messages from Amazon actually comes out, out of order. So ideally, design your systems to assume that they're not necessarily going to come out in sequence. Again, you, you, can, you have to sort of apply a time horizon on that, depending on uh, you know, what, what level of reliability you need in, in the final application. If you don't care about message order, it's not a problem. Um, but if you do care about message order, then you're going to have to set some, some sort of time horizon as to how long uh, you leave it before you, uh, you, know, you hold a message back waiting for the other one that, that you got missed. Because you can't tell the difference between a message that's being missed that, that's been lost and a message that's delayed. I mean, that ultimately is, is the problem. Generally, try to avoid transactions across message queues. Um, a, tr a transaction across message queues are, uh, are really hard. To so it's a hard problem to solve. So try to avoid it if you can. If you want transactions, do it within a server or within a, within a, a fairly 
uh, within something that doesn't rely on, on inter-process message queues, into, well, not necessarily inter-process, but inter-system message queues or anything going across the network, if you can do that. You can't always do that. But, um, if you actually have to use transactions, then look at uh, Raft in particular, but Paxos algorithms which do these, uh, these um, multi-system synchronizations across uh, sort of reliable, so-called reliable transactions uh, across uh, multiple systems. Raft is easier to implement. Um, error handling. Uh, invalid or undeliverable messages, uh, you generally should have a dead letter queue um, which you monitor so that if there's any technical issue with the queuing system, you get some sort of indication coming back. Otherwise, you'll, you won't necessarily know, because all this stuff's happening in the background, you won't necessarily know that something is not right. So uh, ideally, set up a dead letter queue and have those uh, invalid messages go, go through to that. Actual process failures, so if you get an image um, handling uh, server, for example, and someone, for some reason, he gets a PDF and he doesn't know what to do with it, um, then you should report that back on an error queue. And again, you can set up your application such that you actually monitor that error queue in some way. You can't predict how you need to do that, but it's, uh, it's obviously something you need to do. And basically, that's it. So, uh, have we got time for questions? Well, a couple of minutes. I've actually been working on it for uh, to put it into the CMS. There's no reason why it could, shouldn't go into the framework. It's not uh, the only the only reason I haven't done it for the framework is because the framework requires namespaces, and I want to put it into Joomla 2.5 on some occasions, uh, which typically hasn't got the PHP version to handle namespaces. So I've written it as a non-namespaced um, piece of code. Five three, I think it is. Yes. Yeah, but that's the specification. Yeah, but uh, I'm afraid at work I've got a server that's running five two, so <laughs> so I kind of wrote it with that in mind. Uh, but it would be trivially easy actually to change it to a namespaced uh, thing and put it into the framework. That's not a problem. But if you could, then maybe you could also be used in other applications by other people. If it's namespaced, yeah, sure, yeah. I could put it on Composer and stuff like that. It's not yeah. a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Ron. Web services stuff is more of a core type thing. It, it requires, uh, well, ideally, a better architecture within the within the framework. Um, whereas message queuing is is always going to be kind of an optional extra. Really, it doesn't need need to be there. It can be an, a separate downloadable package if need be. Okay. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>